Today on Just Ride Bikes, I'm joined by ex-elite bike racer turned professional cycling coach, Andy Turner, to talk all things related to performance on the bike and reveal how everybody can improve their fitness with as little as four hours a week. Sound too good to be true, right? Now you, like myself, are probably limited on how much time we can actually spend riding a bike. We're not pros, we have day jobs, but regardless of your goals, aspiration and experience, Andy shows how everybody can level up their fitness. He puts a spotlight on many of the myths in training. From FTP to copying the pros, we discuss how age impact training and how you can get more from your riding time without becoming obsessed with power numbers and training zones and cover many of the topics that relate to your performance on the bike. I personally found this discussion really useful, illuminating and insightful and have made changes to my training as I prepare for the Fred Witten this summer. So I hope you find it useful as well. Right, let's dive into it. So Andy, let's start with the big question that quite a few viewers uh, sent in to me. How can you improve your performance on the bike with less time? And I guess, how many hours do you have to commit to get any sort of reasonable improvement in performance? We're we talking four hours, 30 hours, what's the minimum you have to do? I'd say the main thing is you want to get you've got to train smart. Yeah. You can't just ride junk miles or go out chasing high speeds on Strava or doing tempo rides on Zwift all the time or yeah. Zwift races. It's uh, about mixing up what you do quite a bit. A lot of people think you've got to train like a professional or you've got to be doing 30 hours a week. And I mean, the level of training they're doing is purely because they've got the time to rest along with it. So if you're looking at how you can best train to improve for yourself. You want to look at it as a sum of all stresses. So you take, you've got, for example, young children, you've got work, you've got commuting, everything that adds up stress or takes out time of your day. And if you throw in training stress onto that as well, you've got to look at the total sum. So we might have a training stress a week of, I don't know, 400, and a professional might have 1200 but then when you look at the sum of all stresses they're not having to worry about anything else in their life so you might have an equivalent stress of yourself of 1200 as well so you still need to rest as much and if you tried to push the training stress more you then have an cumulative stress greater than a professional but no extra time to rest so you're not going to improve you're going to have overtraining you're going to have plateau or even decrease in performance so it's you need to work out what your available rest is and what your total manageable stress is and sort of work backwards from that. So you kind of reverse engineering yourself a little bit, taking your goal and then where you are and then you sort of funnel that down into what the training plan that will work for you is. And I find for most people, like the junior riders I work with generally sort of 14 hours a week is what they can fit comfortably with school, but they're also younger, they can deal with higher training loads and recover quicker. Whereas someone who is say between 35, 45, they're gonna have more probably family responsibilities, they've got the work, to be honest, between seven and 10 hours is what I'd say would be the maximum for most people. But you can see improvements in fitness in as little as between four and seven. So it's looking at not just how many hours you do on a bike, but how those hours fit into your, into your life in your you know, daily routine, your weekly routine with all your other commitments, which often people don't look at. They look at how many hours they need to do and don't think about the rest you need, which is really important. Something that probably we don't give enough importance to, do we? No, it's something, so whenever I'm doing my coaching questionnaire for people, it's like, what is your time availability during the week? What are your other constraints? It's like a breakdown of what they're doing. So when do they wake up? When have they got to do their commute to work, how long are they in work for, when are they back, how do they feel when they're back, have they got to go and pick kids up, take them to activities, or just you need to spend time with people as well. You've got to take into account social elements too. Um, so it's looking at all of that and then what realistic time there is to train, not just how many hours do you have free, it's what can you realistically manage, and then like, is your work tiring mentally or physically, taking into account all of that. And that's what you need to do for yourself is sort of take stock, analyze where your stresses are, how much time you have both to train and to rest. 
because equally as a professional rider they can just nap for most of the day we don't have that luxury <laughs> that would be nice wouldn't it yeah so so you say between like seven to ten hours of sweet spot but you reckon from four hours onwards you're you're going to see a improvement in performance if you yeah. allocate that amount of time yeah i'd week. say there's an element of how experienced you are as okay. well so someone who's coming into it quite new really any riding they do is going to see an improvement in fitness because yeah. it's a novel training stimulus for them yeah but someone who's been riding for longer, quite often you've got to see a change in the training stimulus or an increase in the stress to see an improvement. But I've sort of experimented on myself a little because I've been cycling for over 10 years now. And the last couple of years, it's been a lot more on off from illness and work. So whereas I used to be doing 20,000 kilometers a year, it's been wow. four at most. <laughs> um, so I've been training roughly between four and seven hours a week. And I'm sure there's an element of having had the residual fitness that's going to be easier for me to get fitness back. But even with riding four to seven hours a week, I've seen quite a drastic improvement. So previously my sort of critical power, threshold, sustainable power was about 280 um, beginning of last year. And then before breaking my arm, I'd got it up to about 340, which is slightly higher than the year I got my second cat license. So it is manageable, but it is about training smart and balancing up what you're doing and doing the right thing. I, even when I'm just going out riding myself, I'm a bit of a sucker for just those tempo miles where you ride between an hour and two at a sort of high pace. So you feel like you've worked hard. Yeah. But the reality is you're not getting much more of a physiological gain than doing, it's been quoted a lot, zone two endurance training. But you get quite a lot more fatigue, which means maybe the next day you have your VO2 max session. But you're a bit fatigued going into it, so you don't get as much out of that as you'd like. So since I've been really committing to my own coaching practices, essentially, of doing the slower endurance work and then doing the high intensity efforts, I've seen quite an improvement from that. Okay. So you mentioned earlier uh, about junk miles, which is something I've heard about. What do junk miles mean and, and what sort of riding, if you've got seven hours to ride a week, what sort of riding do you do in those seven hours? Varies from person to person because for some people, what could be junk miles for another is probably not. I mean, you want to look at what your overall goal from training is and work backwards from that. And for most cycling events, that's going to be aerobic fitness, improving that because... Okay most events are over the duration that it becomes mostly aerobic unless you're doing track sprinting. So you kind of got to break down the components of what make that. And the two biggest ones, you want more muscle capillaries. So more blood is able to be delivered to the muscles because the blood is what carries the oxygen and then more mitochondria, which probably everyone's heard as powerhouse of the cell. What it does is break down fats, fuel, lactate, and turns that into energy, which is ATP, which is the thing we cycle through a lot to basically create every motion. So that uses ATP, everything we do does. So we want more blood with oxygen going to the muscles, then that's used to break down fuels in the muscle by those cells. And the way we get those is from the sort of long, slow endurance training that helps with something called VEGF and that helps with creating more muscle capillaries. Okay. And there's some papers which show that higher intensities actually limit that potential. It's more to do with the amount of muscle contractions you make. So to reduce fatigue, you could either do two hours at 90 RPM zone two or the same at tempo. They're both doing the same amount of muscle contractions. It will both have the same this is sort of a simplified version. It's not going to be exact, but they'll have a fairly similar gain on that front. But the tempo ride is going to lead to more fatigue. So then you need more rest. And again, if you're in that time limited state and you can't afford extra rest, you want to get the most out of your training. And then the next day you might have a high intensity session, which is going to help the sort of more mitochondrial biogenesis, um, which is the powerhouse of the cell as such for breaking down those fuel sources and that comes from more the high intensity efforts and that one is AMPK regulated which is when there's a high ratio of adenosine monophosphate to adenosine triphosphate so the ATP 
adenosine triphosphate. When that's broken down, it splits off molecules. So you get adenosine diphosphate and then monophosphate. And when there's that high gradient between the two, we've used more energy. So it's when you've done the high intensity work, that's when that pathway is activated and helps uh, stimulate more mitochondrial growth. So different training elements, different pathways. It's not saying that you should ignore tempo work because especially if you're doing, say you're doing a sport, if you just want to do 100 miles as quickly as possible, you're going to be working in the tempo region there. You can improve your actual power that you could maintain with those high intensity and low intensity workouts. But then you also need to be able to actually deal with the rate of perceived exertion of riding at that tempo element. So there's still benefit to doing that. And as well, when you go slightly higher to sweet spot workouts, you've got more sort of lactate clearance and buffering. And you just, the more exposure you have to it, the lactate, it helps your body adapt by generating more transporter systems, MCT 1 and 4 for transporting lactate into the working muscle or out of the bloodstream, because that's where you hear about with lactic acid, lactic burn. Mm. In reality, it's hydrogen ions, but you can still reduce the associated level of hydrogen ions by removing the lactate or preventing it from going into the bloodstream. Junk miles, I'd say, long story short, it's anything that's not working towards your goal or at the right time of working towards your goal. So there's a time and a place for everything, really. But smashing tempo rides all the time, probably not going to get the biggest gain in fitness or improvements. Okay, that's what I'm really bad at. Just going out and doing a steady tempo ride all the it time. It feels fun just yeah. riding quickly. So that's another element of it is I've got people that I coach where they really enjoy just a good tempo smash. Yeah. And because they really enjoy it, it makes them feel good and it makes them feel confident when they see that their speed has improved from last time they did one. I'll still incorporate that into a plan because it helps keep the motivation. That's the thing, it's if something keeps you happy and motivated, that's another reason for including it. Even if it's not physiologically the most beneficial, like in reality, a cafe stop during a long ride, having that in the middle, it's not the best thing to do. Um, it all sort of, you know, reset your body, but it reduces the rate of fat oxidation you've got. Okay. You sort of peak at that when you've been riding for a period of time. And when you stop, your body goes into recovery yeah. states. And then when you start again, it's sort of as if you'd just done two separate rides, really. So no cafe rides. <laughs> but at the same time, they're really fun. Yeah. Um, so it's balancing everything up as well. You've got to keep yeah. yourself motivated. You've got to keep cycling fun. You can't just, I've done it before. I've done a month of just turbo rides and it, I couldn't touch the turbo again for six months after that. <laughs> just me personally, it wasn't for me. Yeah. So I guess it's finding something that motivates you, gives you a reason to get on the bike, which is important. And, but also it sounds like mixing it up is important. Kind of a mix of steady stuff and doing intervals. Um, we're filming in January now, so should we be doing more intervals? Should we incorporate that into our schedule this time of year as well? It depends on when your key events are starting. Okay. So I've got quite a few people I'm coaching where the cycle classic is coming yeah. up quite early on, or the track champs are end of February. So they're wanting to get in some quite high capacity race yeah. efforts quite soon. And given that most of us are not, we don't have the time to train of a professional. A lot of talk is spoken about with polarized training and zone two and people are like the 80 20 rule world tour pros might be doing maybe a 90 10 rule at certain times in the year where it's mostly low intensity admittedly their zone two is sort of up to 300 watts for some of them probably more <laughs> but they're riding at a relatively low intensity yeah. but when you have less time available you can't waste if it if you have seven hours a week to train probably don't want to be doing just seven hours of zone two work okay. you want to mix up the variety of it so it might be a 70 30 split it might be a 60 40 again it depends on how much stress you have overall because if you're doing intervals every day it's very stressful if you've not got the time to rest you're not going to recover well you're going to get that overtraining and see a plateau in fitness so you want to mix things up but it's mixing it up relevant to where you are in the training plan and what you're doing so 
if you've got a key event coming later in the season, you're not going to be doing your peak race capacity efforts now, but you are still going to want to be improving your fitness and aerobic fitness components by doing some of those high intensity efforts. It unfortunately depends and varies on what you're doing, but I'm for people not racing professionally, I'm not a fan of excluding efforts at any point in the season, except okay. for a, an off season break. I, my goal during the winter, or the reason I ride during the winter is to be fit for summer, which is a sort of you know, two or three month period when hopefully it could be nice and warm and get out and do some events, sporties, which is not a very defined period in terms of goals. But can that vagueness be something I can work towards in terms of incorporating more intervals into my schedule? Or do I need to be more detailed and say, right, this is a goal event on this date and work back from that date to three months or whatever it might be? I'd say it's useful to work backwards. So okay. summer's quite a good time to look at it because in the UK, at least, we tend to get nicer weather March and April, yeah. sometimes. Um, and especially during the winter, it's darker, it's easier to get low mood and you've got to spend more time cleaning your bike yeah. you can kind of do some people call it reverse periodization but say your event is in july so more than halfway through the year i think a good way of balancing it is to be honest doing more shorter duration intervals pedaling efficiency works at cadence drills on the turbo in the winter when sometimes that's the safest way to do it as well and then you can add more volume in Come the spring. When the weather's nicer. Yeah, because yeah. you'll probably be happier, you'll enjoy yeah. it more. It's more time efficient because you could go out earlier or a bit later and not worry about it being darker because at the end of the day, good quality winter kit and lights, good lights, they're not cheap. So if you want to make the most of your training and also do it cost effectively, I think honestly training indoors over the winter works nicely and then increasing the volume come into the spring. Because it's not that you have to build this huge, big aerobic base. That's sort of something that's built year on year on year. So you'll see improvements if you're doing the intervals in the winter and then move on to longer duration work come the spring. So it's not traditional by any means, but if that's what works best for you with your time availability, with time being able to be spent cleaning the bike or going out when the light allows you that's going to work better and it's not that doing the base miles will slow you down you keep a level of intensity in there if anything what you can do is incorporate intensity into the end of some of those endurance rides because a lot of the time if you're racing it's efforts in the latter stages of the race that's going to be where it counts and even if you're doing the sporty flight the struggle you don't want to just be fresh for all the first climbs and then find that the final few you're going to really struggle with. Pardon the pun. <laughs> um, so you want to be good at the end of the rides as well yeah. with a relatively high intensity. So you can kind of incorporate the two there. You're still going to get, like I said, with um, the high intensity efforts do give you aerobic fitness gains, but you also get different ones from the endurance work. I think for a practical one for most people, even if you can just fit one longer ride in a week, just one day at the weekend, okay. that's a good way of managing it throughout the winter. Because for anyone who works one ride at the weekend, if you've got kids or social yeah. commitments, you've then got Sunday to do that or Saturday. And you can ride maybe three to four hours on the other day. Okay. And then you've got time to clean the bike as well. I think if you keep that on track, then through the rest of the week, just incorporate efforts and you've got a nice balance there. Well, efforts, rest, and active recovery. What about people who might do a lot of commuting? Can you build commuting into that sort of training plan, or they just jump miles, don't count, and you have to do your training separately to those commuting miles? You can definitely incorporate those into there as well. At the end of the day, for most people, hours on the bike are going to result in improvements. So even an hour steady to work and an hour back, it's not useless by any means. It's also very time effective if you're yeah. using your commute to actually get some more hours in. But you can also do specific drills. Depends where you are. Because if you're in a city and you've got constant traffic lights, junctions, yeah. you can't be doing long efforts there and slamming the brakes on at the last minute or riding with your brakes on to try and get from light A to B in a long enough time. But you can be smart with the sort of efforts you do. Um, maybe there is a climb 
up to your office or your house on the way back, you can use that as a bit of a benchmark effort. Or you can do cadence specific drills between their standing starts from the lights if that's safe to do so. You can be clever in the way you fit things in. Okay. Or if you've got a commute that allows a bit more flexibility and freedom in the efforts you do, just sort of break down what is in the route and then think about what sort of efforts you could fit in there. But equally, if you're feeling a bit tired, just use it as a steady ride in. Use it as active recovery. Okay. Because for some people, this is another one that varies from person to person with who I coach, some prefer a rest day where they're not on the bike and they don't touch it. But then others find if they do that, the next day they just feel stiff and not really rearing to go. So for them, half an hour easy is better than doing nothing at all. Okay. So nice long steady ride at weekends, intervals during the week. What sort of intervals would you suggest? Are there like go-to favourites you have? And are you better doing on, on the trainer or on the bike? I guess it's weather dependent as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's dependent on what's available to you in terms of... Because for anything that's a longer effort, it's difficult with junctions or changes of gradients. Yeah. But then things like VO2 max efforts are quite good ones for improving overall fitness. They hurt, which <laughs> is why I also hate doing them, but they are very effective. So if you've got a power meter, you're looking at sort of between... 110 to 120 or 105 to 120 percent of your threshold power um if you've got a heart rate monitor you're looking at getting sort of your heart rate maximum by the last minute of an effort maybe if you're doing four to five minute efforts and for rate of perceived exertion you could maybe spit out a word here or there and come the end of it be struggling to make a noise um those are quite good efforts to do you okay. can they're quite easy to do on climbs yeah. if you've got one long enough for that. On the turbo, they admittedly are quite hard, um, especially with erg mode. I suggest don't use erg mode. Is that when you set a power and you have to ride that power? So the trainer will set the resistance okay. to the power you're doing. But if you start slowing down your pedaling, it increases the resistance to match overall. So it gets harder. Yeah, <laughs> whereas in, if you do it on just level mode where you're using your gears for resistance, yeah. it's all right to let the power drop a bit because the heart rate will stay. Yeah. And that's the, the VO2 peak is the heart rate. So honestly, you're looking more at heart rate than power for those. Okay. But that one's a good one for on the turbo uh, or on the road with climbs. Sweet spot efforts, I find personally for me, work quite well. For some people, they don't, and others, they do. It's, again... Sort of playing around what works for you. So I'd suggest probably two interval days a week where it's like dedicated interval sessions on the turbo. And then if you're doing the zone two ride, maybe an effort or two come the end of the ride. Because okay. you're going to have had all the zone two benefits throughout. And then you've got the fatigue resistance at the end. Whereas if you do the efforts at the start, you switch into sort of more using carbohydrates rather than fats as a fuel source. And it changes the way the training session works, essentially. Um, you'll get more of the gain, uh, the zone two benefits if you keep the intensity lower and then do something at the end of it rather than the other way around. So it basically makes it at the end of the ride, not at the beginning on the first climb. Yeah. So intervals on a trainer make a lot of sense. But if you are riding outside because you like riding outside, you don't have a trainer, can you do more ad hoc intervals like see there's a lamppost and sprint for it? Or are you better go for a very like two minutes on, two minutes off? Do you have to be that detailed with your intervals? I would say if you're riding outdoors, when I set sessions for people, they're always ones that can be done on the turbo. But then if they're doing them outside, my recommendation is the warm up and the cool down can be more varied in length because more often than not, you've got to ride somewhere where it's suitable to do the effort. Yeah. So quite a roads and yeah, let's take the VO2 max effort. So four minutes on five minutes off. But I'll say to people like, don't worry about the gap in between the efforts so much as long as it is five minutes it can be longer. So okay. say there is a climb on their route that is between three and a half and four and a half minutes long. If it's three and a half minutes long, you can start the efforts a little bit earlier on and aim for that. And if you finish just before the top of the climb and you've got to go up that very slowly, fair enough. It's okay. still going to be, you've done the effort right. It doesn't yeah. matter if you do the rest of the climb a bit slower. And then it might be six minutes, ten minutes to get to the next climb to do that or the next stretch of road that's suitable. I think it's good to mix up efforts on climbs and flats because you use slightly different muscle patterns depending on what you're on. Yeah. But 
just being a bit more flexible, you can be a bit more ad hoc with it. Like there's a general structure for what you want from that session. But if you're a few seconds here or a few seconds there on either side of the effort and there's a longer gap between them, then that's all right. You don't have to be 100% all the time. You don't have to stress if you miss the start of your next one, you can be more relaxed about it. And yeah. I think it sounds like doing an interval and a climb might be a bit easier given the gradient working against you. So you maybe a bit easier. And if you live somewhere hilly, of course, but if you don't have the hills, you a bit, bit of a challenge, isn't it, really? Yeah, again, it's breaking down what your end goal is. Yeah. Um, for most people, a lot of events they do, it's a climb is often part of the feature of their event and where it's going to be important to produce that power. But if you're a time trialist or a pursuiter, where you're doing four minutes effort, you want to be very good at producing that on the flat and ideally in an aerodynamic position. Whereas on the climbs, you can be out of the saddle, you can be sitting more upright. So again, it's sort of, you've always got to look back, look back from where your end goal of the training is. And if it's just to get fitter and have fun, yeah, use the climbs. If it's specifically 10 mile time trials and events that are flat where you need to produce power, do some efforts on the flat as well. Okay. I guess it depends on your actual goal, whether you're racing, time trialing, sportive. I know lots of viewers have said they're doing sportives, which seems to be quite a popular one. And I'm doing a sportive in the summer. And for me, the goal of getting around in a reasonable kind of state and not falling apart in the last few climbs. Um, so I guess tailoring your riding now to the goal event and like where it's going to be lots of climbing or long distance can help. Would that make a difference to the riding you do now as well and over the next few months? I'd say, especially, so that's the struggle. Uh, Fred Witten. Fred Witten. Yeah, oh, for my yeah. sins. <laughs> yeah, so that one is hilly. Yeah. So you're going to want to be comfortable on different climbs, especially ones with steeper gradients. So packing the climbs as much as I can is going to be an obvious focus, I guess. Well, because even with quite light gearing on some of those climbs, you're going to be, you end up quite hunched over, so you yeah. close your hip angle a bit and you're also working at quite a low RPM. So some low RPM cadence drills will probably be quite good okay. for you. And then getting used to, because when you go into that sort of cramped over climbing position, you change the length of your muscles and you change how the firing pattern is. So okay. that's what I did my university dissertation on. And especially in climbs like 14, 20%, it's very different how your muscles work. So you want to be riding on climbs like that getting used to it because then you're more likely if you don't do that you'll be more likely to get things like cramps because yeah. you're doing something that the muscles aren't used to so if you train that as part of your training sessions you come to the steep climbs at the Fred Witten and hopefully your body will be more adapted and ready for them okay. and then again if you're doing climb efforts at the end of your endurance ride those climbs at the end of the Fred Witten should feel that little bit easier how do you track your training and do you need heart rate? Do you need power? Do you need all that? I guess if you're trying to race or train at a high level, you do, it makes a lot of sense and it's more accessible. But if you're put off by a high cost, do you need all that? Can you just go on feel? Yeah, definitely. You don't need to have a heart rate monitor and a power meter. I won't lie in saying it's, you get more data out of it and you yeah. can see more in there. I think it's a bit like with things like these metric monitors that do heart rate variability and stuff. My experience of heart rate variability, it tells me how I already know I'm feeling. Okay. And a power meter will tell you you're working hard when you're working hard. A heart rate monitor will read a high heart rate when you can feel physically your heart beating as yeah. fast as it can. So they're not necessary, but I think what they do is help add into the training log. So whether you're keeping track in Strava or training peaks or even just a physically written training diary i think that's the way to keep track of things so i use training peaks for the most part because you can have your heart rate you've got your power but you can also fill out a rate of perceived exertion so okay. one to ten and then also a sort of basic mood profile where you just have very frowny face and very smiley face and somewhere in between there you put where you're feeling because even heart rate or power by itself doesn't give that much information. Um, you want to look at it as a broader picture. So it's like the heart rate is the internal work, the power is the external. So if your heart is putting out this much work to generate 
as much power. It's useful to know, but then it's how do you gauge the improvement or what does it mean? Yeah. Because if your power goes up and your heart rate stays low, it can mean different things. It might be that you're getting fitter, in which case your rate of fatigue exertion might have dropped and your feeling on the bike is strong. Equally, it could be that you're getting quite fatigued. Okay. So your RPE might be creeping up and your feeling on the bike might not be as good. So keeping track of that is very important, those sort of internal subjective measures. You've got to be aware of them as well. And so if you've got a training diary, add notes to it on how you feel. But it's quite good just using speed. If you go out and have a loop that you regularly do... Like average speed. ...is the trend. Because I know Strava does that with um, average speed. It does trends. Yes. And let's say you do your 40K loop, and it will vary day to day, uh, but you might see a trend that's zigzagging up. And as long as you put in sort of maybe notes on how you felt on the ride, like did this feel particularly hard, what were the conditions like, because if it's windy and rainy, you'll be a bit slower... So doing things like that, and then you can see an overall picture of, oh, okay, the last time I did this loop, I was four minutes slower, but I actually felt stronger today or that I was putting out less effort than back then. Yeah. So clearly my fitness has gone up. Or just a regular climb that you do. It might be one that's quite close by and you do it absolutely flat out each time and you can see the trend as it goes up and increases in speed. So I think keeping track of things either with Strava or Training Peaks, I think is probably the best one because I think with Strava, the segments you now have to pay to see how you compare on them. To Training Peaks, the free version is all that people need for the most part. Okay. You can see what you're doing. Okay. You can see how many hours you're fitting in. Yep. And you can keep track of just with RPE. If you're not using power or heart rate, it's quite easy to do that. And I'd say for riders, if they're wanting to get one thing to measure, metrics, heart rate's probably the first place to start. Okay. It's useful for the endurance rides, it's useful for the high intensity stuff, but it's also very good at telling you a bit about yourself. If you know your max heart rate and you know you're not reaching it anymore, you might be getting fatigued. So you know it's maybe best to take a break. Or if it's really, really high and you're not feeling it or working any harder, maybe there's a bit of illness coming on. So I think heart rate tells you the most overall info. It's just important to sort of understand what it's telling you. Yeah. Power is then a useful addition to that. And with power, there are some good value options available, but you do want to make sure that it's going to be accurate and reliable. So you want it to actually, it's, you want it to be consistent within itself. Because even if it's not reading the power that you're actually doing, as long as it's consistent... From one day to the next. You can yeah. gauge improvement. Yeah. At the end of the day, whoever crosses the line first in a race or finishes their event with a PB, doesn't matter what the number is that it says. That's completely irrelevant. Um, it's about seeing your own personal progression. I, I've tested a few power meters and some of them read 30 watts higher than the benchmark and some are 20 watts lower yeah. but as long as they are consistent within themselves yeah. you can get a good idea of progress and improvement on that metric but even then power is not the be all and end all it's speed is the main thing so you can become more efficient with your pedaling you can get better at holding a more aerodynamic position on the bike mm. those will increase speed without affecting power so it's a useful metric, but there's a lot of detail and information around it that I think you can get more out of just monitoring what your relative performance is to yourself. That's nice to know. Yeah. Because a lot of time crunch cyclists won't have you know, the time to invest in learning how to use heart rate and, and power meter and decoding what it actually means. And you probably could add too much complexity to your training and think you're doing one thing we're actually doing the other, so it could be possibly counterproductive and and just strip away that complexity and just focus on, like say, rotor performance. Could be an easier, certainly if you're more not a beginner, but you're trying to find improvements without going too extreme in your training approach. I've also seen people getting obsessed with numbers yes. when there's so many different metrics to take yeah. into account. They 
they sort of let the numbers tell them how they're feeling. Okay. Because, um, again, with heart rate variability, I've seen people with heart rate variability trackers or recovery things, and they've said, oh, it says my recovery score is low, but I feel great. What yeah. should I do? Should I listen to this thing on my wrist, or should I listen to how I actually am feeling and knowing myself? Yeah. Or equally, it says they're really fresh and they feel really tired and they need a rest day. They will sometimes listen to the tracker and go out and train anyway. It's sort of <laughs> not really ideal. Yeah. And then you get people chasing fitness scores and comparing power numbers from theirs to their friends or anything yes. else. And I've seen it that. becomes too much with it's all got to be individualized and focused on you as yourself, not anyone else. Yeah. So focus on that and the big things that come there are those measures like RPE, how you feel on the bike. Those are really important metrics. I was testing a Garmin Edge the last few months and it has a recovery time feature. Sometimes it gives me like 40 plus hour recovery time. I'm like, I can't take 40 hours to recover. I had that during a stage race and it gave me 72 hours 72 to recover hours, and well. I had a stage the next day and that wasn't really good for the morale. <laughs> I don't know how accurate that is though. Is it accurate or is it... Is it a wild figure? I can't say I'm sure about how they measure the okay. recovery metrics there. I imagine it's taking the stress that it's accounted for from the session yeah. and then also your previous stresses. So if you're used to dealing with a certain amount, then it knows you can deal with more. So someone who's not ridden before, doing an hour on the bike is going to be quite tough. Yeah. Whereas for someone who's used to doing four hour rides, an hour on the bike is pretty easy. So it will probably take into account relative metrics and what people are used to. So it's that chronic versus acute training load. Okay, yeah. So that's that's the risk of a lot of the technologies giving you false readings almost with recovery time or how you're doing or improving or... And also if you're not understanding fully, yeah. like in a training phase, you'll want to be working at a level where you're not quite fully recovered. Yeah. That's what they call functional overreaching where you stress the body and the response is that the body then has to adapt and it does that by basically becoming fitter you need to stress it and you won't be recovered probably in the next day fully but then you've got to incorporate the rest because if you don't rest then you won't see that training adaptation okay, yeah. so i can see some elements of it being useful but i can't really dive into or critique it too much about knowing <laughs> fully how they do it okay. but i'd say listening to your own body is the best way to go and becoming quite aware and in tune of how it's feeling that's something i had to teach myself over quite a few years and try and teach any athlete that i coach sort of to listen and understand themselves so it's always nice to see them take the initiative sometimes like if they wake up feeling overly tired if it's an easy session they've got to do then I'll give them a little nudge to do that as long as they're not showing signs of illness. If it's a really hard key session that they're probably not going to achieve because they're feeling overly tired, it might just be because they had a late night the night before because they had extra work. Yeah. So that's that stress has increased. So you've got to adapt the training slightly. So I'll say to them, okay, don't do that effort session today. Let's maybe bring forward the rest day. We'll do that effort session the day after when you're more rested but then you had this session the day after will reduce the intensity of that so you're not overly fatigued going into the day after that. So it's all, you can't just drag one thing somewhere and hope to change the rest of it. You've got to look and, again, take that sum of all stresses. So whereas before we had efforts, rest, key session, now we've switched it so it's efforts, then key session. So we want to change stuff around there as well okay. just to see where the stress is how that's going to build up and how much recovery time they need so i'd say for people wanting to build their own training plan don't worry about switching days around or even if you've just got to miss a day and have two rest days in a row it's not a big stress everyone has to do it and you're not going to be losing out to someone else and the worst thing you can do is stress about it because then that adds another yeah. stress into it well, you say it's easier said than done because I'm really bad at listening to my body. I'm getting better. I think oh, I feel tired today and taking a day off, but then I feel guilty for not riding a bike that day. And I think, well, I'm missing out a day or two days and I'm losing fitness and I'm or losing the opportunity to get fitter. So you, you can feel guilty. And that it's, it's tough to kind of find a place to be comfortable with. 
Yeah, I'd say some practical ways to sort of help with that are, say part of your schedule was you had an hour to train and you're not feeling great, so you've not got that hour anymore. So maybe you can use that hour to, there was a job you were going to do at the weekend, something to tidy or fix. You can then do that through that hour. That's good thinking. You've given yourself another hour at the weekend where you could do something and it's not added any additional stress anywhere. Or you can do some basic S&C work or some mobility stuff that's going to reduce the uh, chance of getting injured or improve strength on the bike. There's other things you can fit in that might just be short and effective and not as fatiguing. Or, like I said, the idea of fitting in a job that you'd save for the weekend in that hour that you had dedicated to riding a bike, because it's a free hour essentially now. So if you switch it to then, I don't know, for me it's probably going through organising emails or putting yeah, same. files and folders in the right place. Admin. Life admin. <laughs> yeah. So if I then do that on that day where I've missed the training session, yeah. I've given myself an hour spare at the weekend to fit in either an additional hour or a different sort of session. Or if I'm just feeling completely run down, it's another hour of rest. Yeah. So it's thinking like that and not... It all comes down to stress. And stressing about missing training is going to make stress worse. And that's going to impact training as well. Yeah. You mentioned something earlier about riding a regular route and using that as a sort of benchmark. That's quite a good idea. Having like a route of a, I don't know what distance, 15, 25k, have that as a benchmark and ride that every week, every month perhaps. Mm -hmm. And use that as a sort of a, a way to measure your performance. Can that work? Yeah, it can be quite a good way of doing it. You... You don't want to get into the habit of riding it at that tempo pace all the time. Yeah. Um, what you want to do is compare it basically sub-maximally. So, I mean, if you're going at a race for seat exertion of three or four, that's probably zone two. You can talk in full sentences. And you're seeing a trend that when you do that loop at that effort level, it's getting quicker. That's a good sign that your base fitness is increasing. You can then use, I think it's better to use shorter segments for doing okay. higher capacity efforts. So local time trials are great. A 10 mile time trial at your local club, you can do the same course again and again and again and see your times change. And if you've not changed your equipment or anything like that, you can see a rough trend. You'll get variations because you have different weather conditions, air pressure and wind, rain, things that will affect it. But that overall trend is what you're looking for. So you won't see a nice straight line of progress. It will very much be a, and then there's your high pressure day, yeah. and then there's your super low pressure day. But as long as you've got that overall trend. So yeah, I think just using Strava segments or TT courses or loops and just timing that and keeping track of how you feel during it. And that's where the training diary comes in and just putting how you're feeling and how the ride itself felt. Okay. What do you do if you feel you've plateaued in terms of your fitness? You're like, you're riding every week, you don't feel getting any faster or stronger. Is there a ceiling to everybody's sort of fitness potential or is it just a case where you need to change your training to add in some different intervals or do something different to add more variety? So, I think more often than not, it comes down to varying training stimulus. Okay. We're all quite good at getting into habits, yes. but we stick to those habits possibly a bit too routinely. So... It's good to get into a habit of, say, doing an hour or two of riding every day, every other day, three days in the week and two at the weekend, but we tend to just repeat the cycle again and again, whereas what you'll need to do is switch the efforts up a bit. So that's often people that have come to me for coaching help. It's been that they've plateaued, and you look back on the training, it tends to be very similar stuff they've done. Okay. Quite often it's that tempo riding stuff, and they do get fitter, but then it plateaus. And I won't have to add in extra hours normally. It's more a case of changing the training stimulus. So often it's reduce the intensity on those longer rides and then do more key efforts. It might also be that you need to do more pedaling efficiency work. Um, it's quite easy for a lot of us to not be particularly efficient at pedaling. I remember at uni when we used to get rugby players in to do power stuff on the bike yeah. they'd have numbers that were through the roof and even watts per kilo that were very good 
but it didn't translate into much performance on the road because they weren't efficient with the pedal stroke. So when the left leg was pushing down, the right leg was almost resisting that. Okay. So it gives a higher power number because there's more torque going through both pedals, but it's torque going the wrong way. <laughs> so pedaling efficiency is another thing to look at. And then even how you're fueling your training. So you might be plateauing because your recovery isn't quite right or you're not fueling your sessions well enough. Yeah. If you've got high intensity sessions and you're not eating the right foods beforehand, you're not going to get as much out of them. Um, equally, if you're not recovering with the right foods afterwards, you're not going to see the same benefits because um, the food comes into afterwards more of like a recovery and rest. And then beforehand, it's the fueling, the workload, you'll get more out of your session. So that's where the training diary is very useful yeah. because you can see what someone's been doing. And so like when I look through people's training history, I can see areas where I go, okay, they've been doing the same thing repeatedly. They need to change things up or I can see where things have been going wrong. And again, with that questionnaire I mentioned, I send to people, there's always a question about how do you fuel your training before, during and after? Um, just because you want to get an idea of that element of it. And then even if someone has got a lot of the elements right and they're still missing from the stimulus, you can look at things like adding strength and conditioning in there. So that's something I recently did a bit of a self-experiment on was a 12-week strength and conditioning program. Riding on average four hours a week, so not Just four hours much at all. And then two half-hour strength sessions a week. Quite basic for the most part because yeah. I'd broken my arm and was still recovering, so I couldn't use heavy weights or have things hanging. Do you mean off the bike weights, like dumbbells yeah. and stuff? Okay, yeah. And that led to a surprising, like by my standards, quite a surprising increase in performance across five second, one minute, five minute and 20 minute power. Admittedly, again, it might be part of the reason I saw a bigger improvement was because I used to do quite a bit of strength training and obviously more training on the bike. And in some ways it's sort of easier to get that back with less training stimulus but the fact was I think that you will still see a noticeable gain incorporating a bit of a strength training routine because it helps with improving pedaling efficiency muscle fatigue ability um, recruitment of muscle fibers because humans are annoyingly inefficient so when you push with all of your might with your leg you've got, let's just for the sake of argument, this is not accurate, a thousand fibers in the leg. And when you push absolutely to your maximum, you might only use 700 because we're just not very efficient at using them. We try and save energy. We don't want to use that many because it uses a lot of energy. But if you do strength training, which stimulates more motor unit recruitment, so we have the nerves which go to the motor unit and it recruits a number of cells to contract we can increase the number it recruits, which is why when people go to the gym, they see big strength gains quite quickly in terms of what they can lift. So even a brief strength program will see more motor unit recruitment. And then instead of recruiting 700, you're now recruiting 800 or more. So you get more bang for the same nerve impulse. Yeah. And that can then translate to on the bike, you can, because you have access to recruiting more fibers, you don't need to use them all. And when they start fatiguing, you start recruiting different fibers. So you get benefits with fatigue resistance, time to exhaustion, whereas people used to think it was just for sprint work. The reality is strength training helps with a huge variety of aerobic fitness areas. And it's an interesting one because it's not one you'd necessarily think of lifting a heavy weight for just five or six reps can have quite an impact in your performance as pedaling at 90 RPM for three hours. Yeah. But it's definitely worth looking into. And it's something that's becoming a lot more in trend, certainly. You see more articles about it. You see more teams mm. are incorporating it. Um, more people are starting to do it. And I think there is a genuine reason to look into doing that, even if it's a fairly basic program. So and even if it's more from an injury prevention aspect. Yeah. Because if you want to be training consistently, you don't want injury to get in the way of that. So you're saying all cyclists should join the gym and do some weight training? Not even necessarily join the gym. You can, do stuff at home. 
Yeah, there's a lot of mobility and strength work you can do at home using body weight. Okay. Um, I think if you really want to do peak performance and looking at, especially for those racing, or actually as well for people who are getting older, it's important to do, because this is one issue with cycling, is it's non-weight bearing. So there's no stimulus to help with bone maintenance. And the unfortunate thing is, as we get older, we get a reduction in bone mineral density. Um, and cycling does not help that mm. at all. It's good for muscles, but not for bones. So strength work can help maintain bone mineral density, which means as you're getting older, you're less likely to get lower back issues or anything like that. And there are other ways you can manage that, such as cross training at times with running because the impact helps. But equally, if you're not used to that, you can get yeah, injuries yourself. exacerbated. Yeah. So I'd say the strength work is very good for helping with bone mineral density. So for older athletes, it's good to do to help maintain. And actually for younger, it's good to increase that bone mineral density. So at the point when it does start to plateau or decrease, you're at least starting from a higher threshold. So it's something I've looked at for myself because my family history on my dad's side has a history of prostate cancer, which probably means I'm going to have treatment at some point, which means that the bone mineral density is going to reduce more. So I know it's important to make sure it's at a good level now so that I don't have issues later in life. Because it's one of the key issues people have is um, fractures. Like as people get older, oh, yeah. fractures, if it's yeah. say the hip or something. Yeah, it's fall over. Yeah. yeah, and that comes from <coughs> maybe walking ability becomes affected. And a big part of that is bone mineral density and muscle function. So strength training is good for long-term health and longevity. So even if you're not looking at it as peak performance, it's very good to do for just overall health and function. I think the reason most cyclists and myself have never done any sort of weights is, is trying to get the weight down of the body because you know, the lighter you are, usually the faster you climb. And I've always lacked power, so I try to keep the weight down to try and keep my sort of power to weight ratio reasonable. Uh, but as I'm getting older now, past 40, I've joined the gym last year um, with an eye to the future, like you say, and found, you know, I've had a bad back the last few years, which have given me a bit, because I don't do any stretching, typical cyclist. Finish by rice, sit on the sofa, eating cake and stuff. So trying to do more mobility, core work, and, and just general functional sort of weight training. I found a, a benefit in just the last, and like during the winter, swapping an hour on a bike for not even an hour in the gym, but going to the gym for you know, 30 minutes, I found real benefits. So I guess that's something that more of us should probably look at, even if we are adverse about, it's not putting weight on it, not bulking up, it's just increasing that sort of bone density and a bit of general kind of fitness, isn't it, really? Yeah, and I'd say one thing people might worry about is how do they fit it into their routine. Yeah. Um, you can do at-home stuff uh, with fairly minimal equipment, or... You can look at joining a gym and say there's one near where you work. If you're commuting, maybe go to it before work or after work just because then you've not got to make another travel journey. Yes. Yeah. Or if you take your children to a class or a thing that maybe lasts an hour, take them to that, go to the gym in between, pick them yeah. up, head back. Otherwise, you've got drive there, drive back, drive there, drive yeah. back. It's just a bit more time efficient. Um, so that's probably a good way of fitting that in there yeah so we've we talked for quite a while now without mentioning ftp which is something yes. i know a lot of cyclists are obsessed with or concerned with and if you are looking to train to a reasonable level and buy on a heart rate monitor and power meter and we talk about zones quite a bit i guess we need to talk about how do you establish your zones and is ftp really that important or should i not worry about it i think ftp is an interesting one because it's come under quite a lot of scrutiny recently and in some ways rightly so but in other ways it's a bit of sort of cycling science snobbery okay and i'm slightly guilty of this myself a bit of bragging um, rights about an ftp isn't it i watch your ftp it's like trump uh, top trumps isn't it for, yeah uh, it's an interesting one because nor mm, it depends how people base their ftp have they done a 60 minute test or have they done a 20 minute test yeah. or have they done a 20 minute test with a five minute fatiguing effort beforehand yeah. Because the real way of doing it, when it was initially Andy Coggan, I think, was the guy That's who right, yeah. came up with it, it was a five-minute all-out test before horrendous. a 20-minute all-out test. 
Yeah. And in reality, <laughs> that's very similar to a critical power test where you use two maximal efforts to determine a sort of reliable, sustainable performance. Because the problem is if you just went for 20 minutes flat out, it's very unlikely that 95% of that is going to be what you can sustain for an hour. Yeah. Whereas the original test, which was five minutes flat out, 20 minutes flat out, that's a bit more reliable because you've already fatigued yourself beforehand. And then, I can't remember with that one, if you take the 20 minute and then times by 0.95, or if you just take that fatigue 20 minute. But that's a lot more sim similar to critical power, which is where you take different effort durations and it creates a power curve yeah. for you. And that's accurate up to a certain level, generally to about 45 minutes, but I found it work effectively for 60 minutes on some people. Okay. But what they all come down to is a sustainable maximal steady state, and whether that's lactate or FTP or critical power or ventilatory threshold two, they're all pretty similar in this sort of zone of area. And day to day, it's not gonna be the same anyway, it's gonna vary ever so slightly. So I think for most people using FTP to set your power zones for training, it's going to be fairly effective. Okay. Um, and you say that five minute, 20 minute test is the best way to do it? There yeah. aren't any other, like a ramp test or anything like that? Is in, no, in ramp test to... is quite often, depending on the type of ride or a ramp test will either overread or underread okay. by quite a margin. I've seen some studies into people doing ramp tests followed by submaximal tests afterwards and those look a bit more accurate but again it's taking multiple metrics to derive a sort of broader picture of things um, but i'd say for most people ftp test is going to be all right for you and then just base your efforts off of that the thing is if it reads proportionally too high you'll find your vo2 max efforts are maybe 105 to 115 percent of that if it reads a bit low you just do a slightly higher intensity Okay. So again, that's coming down to that RPE, VO2 max efforts, flat out for five minutes. Uh, sweet spot efforts, comfortable but hard for 15, 30 minutes. So it's getting down to that RPE elements again. I personally, with the people I coach, do the critical power testing because I get that broader picture. Yeah. So I get five second, one minute and five minute test five second and one minute are for their sprint power and then glycolytic capacity which is sort of short sharp anaerobic very short hill climb effort and then the five minute i use along with a test another day in that week which is three and 12 and then put that into excel work out the slope and the intercept on there and that gives you basically a power curve which should tell you if you put in a time duration how long they can maintain that power for and it's generally accurate to 35 45 minutes but i found it worked well for 60 minutes for people in terms of how much of a bragging number it is <laughs> it's an interesting one because in the uk we're obsessed with 10 mile and 25 mile time trials which for people on the faster side are 20 minutes and an hour or 20 minutes and 50 minutes if you're going the same speed so there is use in that regards but equally as I said before, with pedaling efficiency, you can get a high power number and not translate it into great speed. Okay. So I've seen people, time trialists, who go, even with fairly similar coefficient of drag, go faster for fewer watts. And part of that's probably because they've got a more efficient pedaling stroke, or equally their power meter underreads massively and they're putting out way more power in the person's, okay. other person's overreads. I remember someone, he had... Um, I won't say which brand it was because I don't know whether it was necessarily that brand or whether he just calibrated it badly. But I remember his 20 minute power was 480 watts. Wow. But he went significantly slower than me on climbs when I was doing 400 and he weighed five kilos less than me. Wow, yeah, something odd there. <laughs> so he had a good bragging number, but it didn't actually result in much. And then there's also what numbers are actually relevant for what you're doing. Because yeah. if you've got a really good 20 minute power, Okay, if you're doing a 20 minute time trial, great. What if you're doing a five minute climb at the end of your six hour event full of climbs? Yeah. What's your power like then? Yeah. So that's more sort of maximum aerobic power and then what's coming up more in research at the moment is resilience, which is 
what your power is after you're fatigued. So uh -huh. the big difference with the world tour riders is, yes, they produce a huge 20 minute power, but they're doing it on a climb at the end of a 200K stage, 18 days into a race. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's in, like with Zwift, you see there's a lot of people with high five and 20 minute powers and they're doing numbers that are close to like world tour pros, even exceeding some of them. But how are they then doing it, like I said, into a five hour stage, yeah. 18 stages in? So that's where things become important. And even then, sprinting's a big metric that people forget. Uh, you've got two people, one of them rides on the front at 400 watts for an hour, impressive numbers. Someone else rides behind him at 300 watts for an hour, saving all his energy, and then just sprints around at the end. Who's won the race? Yeah, yeah. And I guess FTP is useful to find your, your zone stuff, but like doing a sportive, knowing your 20 minute power, like you say, isn't that, that useful? It's useful in training if you are prepared to go to that level in training. But it sounds like, I mean, you are biased here, you are a coach, to make that clear. Um, but coaching versus uncoached, can you do a lot of this on your own? It sounds, a lot of what you're talking about, it sounds quite complex. And a lot of people might be like, I don't, it's all gobbledygook to me, so maybe a coach is the best way. I'd say it all. coaching makes it easier for you, but even if you're being coached, I'd recommend you do read around the subject, put some time yeah. into learning and reading. So I yeah. follow quite, I still learn a lot just because it's always changing and people test new things, find new ideas. So following some good coaches or sports scientists on Twitter, X, whatever it's, it's called, called yeah. now, <laughs> I find is quite a good one because okay. they do share interesting data and then also learning to be quite critical. So even, I think it's good when people I coach question why I'm doing something because if I can't answer why I'm doing something, then it's useless. Yeah. So questioning things, questioning the research you read and applying it to yourself. So I think you can learn to self coach. If you're very good at looking at things objectively, rather than subjectively. I'm not good at that. That's why I'm not the best at coaching myself. I, one of the other coaches who I work with, we sort of coach each other a bit okay. because we both look at things subjectively rather than objectively. Yeah. But I think people can learn a lot for themselves and it is important, even if you go down the coaching route, to keep learning about yourself, yeah. keep questioning things. But there are some good YouTube channels out there with people sharing advice on training and um, even like experience of what's worked for them you can always try it on yourself see yeah. how it works yeah. experiment learn new things i say the thing with coaching is it kind of compresses that process so rather than learning all of this for yourself going through the process of getting a degree and researching all these elements you get someone else to do that for you and apply it to you but equally only you know yourself no one else is going to know that so even if you go for coaching, that's why the coach-athlete relationship's got to be really, it's very important because the coach needs to learn from you. Yeah. If the coach just says, right, this is going to be the best thing for you without having learned anything about you, it's not particularly, it's probably not going to be the right thing. You've got to learn yourself a bit yeah. about you, what works for you, what you enjoy. And with people just starting out riding, I've had people come to me ask about coaching. I've said, honestly, you don't need it at the moment. Just go and ride your bike more, ride with groups, learn bike handling skills, ride more and read stuff. So I haven't done so much recently, but I used to post quite a lot on my website to try and just help people understand a bit more about what they're doing. So I think, long story short, you probably will get a bit more out of a good coach and there are plenty about, but it's important to try and learn about it yourself and about yourself. And you can do that whether you're coached or not. And I think just try and get a broad variety of information and knowledge in. Um, look at people in similar situations to you and at training for similar goals to you. What do they do? And learn for yourself sort of to be able to break down your event into the components needed for it. So we've got the Fred Witten. We know there's going to be steep climbs, so it's good to train up steep climbs. That's going to be something that will improve already. It's a long endurance event, so 
You're going to want to get used to riding for longer periods just to make sure that your kit's all right. You want to know your saddle and your bib shorts are going to be comfortable for that period of time. You want to know whether you start getting numb hands. Do you need to change the position a bit to reduce pressure on your wrists or should you wear gloves or double padded bar tape? Um, and then you've got the physiological elements of it, which are long endurance rides. So you need those long, slow endurance rides but there's also those high intensity efforts that you've got to do up climbs and there's going to be benefits doing that too. Um, you're probably going to want to maintain a power for the most part at your sort of first threshold, which is when you go from burning predominantly fats to carbohydrates. And then on the climbs, you don't want to go excessively hard because you generate a lot more fatigue metabolites, which won't clear for the rest of it. So you can break down your event into those components and work out where you need to train towards. Mm -hmm. But it just takes a bit of time. And I'd say that coaching streamlines that whole process for people. Okay. I imagine some people are better coached or some people can coach themselves. It depends what sort of person you are and your level of experience sounds like a big factor as well. We should talk about training plans as well. Is it worth following a training plan? There are lots out there like training peaks, uh, Strava, I'm sure have training plans you can download and follow. Is it worth following one of these or make your own training plan from scratch? I think the ones that you can get off the shelf from Strava, Training Peaks, Zwift, those, the thing they do is they offer a consistent plan to sort of keep you accountable. I think that can help quite a lot of people. If you've not got a plan to stick to, it can be a bit difficult to find a reason to keep mm. doing the sessions. And for the most part, those plans tend to offer a nice variation of stuff. They're not individualized in terms of other than just been set to your threshold power but they do offer something that keeps you accountable and you can do the only issue is that they're not adjustable around so say you have a work trip that pops up out of nowhere yeah. or you've got to work late one night it doesn't tell you how to then alter sessions for the rest of the plan okay, yeah. so that's where you need to have either input from a coach or know what you're going to do yeah. to optimize it and honestly if you're stressed and worried about what to do best thing to do is just have additional rest because the reason you've missed that session is probably because of an additional stressor if you don't use an off-the-shelf plan then i'd say the best bet for most people is go for a plan where you've got at least two rest days a week probably at least two interval sessions a week and then one two to three hour ride or two plus hour ride a week um, you can do more than that if the weekend allows it so say if we were just to go for a basic one that will offer I'll tot up the hours at the end of it but we've got Monday rest day okay off the bike yeah okay Easy. or if you prefer active recovery half okay. an hour spin especially in the summer out yeah. on the road clear your head yeah. feels good might be better for you than resting fully that very low level yeah Okay, yeah. And then Tuesday, we would have a key interval session, so maybe an hour at most. Okay. Wednesday, hour or two, depending on the time of year and availability. If it's lighter, nicer weather, two hours outside. If it's cold, dark winter, one hour inside. Easy, zone two. Thursday, we look at doing another interval session, so you've had that gap in between them, so you should be able to perform both those key sessions well friday rest day and then weekend maybe you do two rides sort of maybe one two hour and one three hour or maybe you've only got time to ride one day so you do one three to four hour ride and then another rest day uh, it doesn't matter if you've got two rest days in a row there it might just be what works best with your time availability because the weekend is often when we've got time to do the jobs we haven't had yeah. during the work week but then you've got roughly one, two, three, four, five, six-ish hours to use in a week. And you've only ridden four days. Okay, yeah. And on the weekend, if you have both days ride, are you better to do two short rides, say, say two hours, or do one longer four-hour ride, which is a better kind of use of your time and better fitness improvement? I'd say prioritise one longer ride. Okay. Um, because... With no cafe stop, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Ideally, time the cafe stop nearer towards the end. Okay, um, for that sprint. Yeah, the but equally, if you need to refill food and yeah, drink, yeah. then do that. And if the group wants to stop part way yeah. through, stop with them and enjoy it because it will be fun. Yeah. Um, it's that balance in there as well, like training versus 
been sociable and having a nice time. Yeah, and equally, uh, if people I coach, sometimes they pop up and say, right, a few friends of mine have said we want to go mountain biking this weekend. Can I change that up? And it'll be different because it'll be varying intensity. Yeah. There'll be a lot of downhill work where they're not paddling at all. They'll be going up the hills where it's probably higher intensity, but they're going to have a lot of fun. It's going to keep them motivated to follow the rest of the plan. And also you learn some skill elements from it. Yeah. So it's off plan, but there's still a big benefit towards it. Okay. Um, but yeah, sorry, going back to the... Long ride, but better than two short rides, if you can do that. Yeah, I'd say prioritising one longer ride is better because for the sort of the aerobic fitness gains with that yeah. more muscle capillarization, better fat utilization, you want to go for longer. Yeah. Whereas if you do the two shorter ones, it takes a little bit of time before you get into that area of achieving those benefits. Yeah. And so if you do two two hour rides, you might have an hour or half an hour where you're getting the real benefits. Whereas if you do that four hour ride, you've got two and a half hours of achieving those real benefits. Yeah. And if you're doing a sportive, that longer ride is going to be a clear, clear big benefit for you, isn't it, really? Yeah, as well with like what I mentioned, if you're doing those longer rides, it's not that you have to do an eight-hour ride to be able to complete an eight-hour ride, but it's good to do a longer ride to know if your position might, say, lead to excess pressure on your wrists. A lot of people, when they're getting bikes now, there's more racy bikes being bought with yeah. low head tubes and far out stems and everything everyone wants that pro look with the big saddle to bar drop which i used to do yeah guilty admittedly for racing but now i've changed my position a lot that i'm not racing <laughs> and it's sort of where you want to make sure your setup is right so if yeah. you've got that racy position you might be putting quite a lot of force through your hands and getting quite a bit of discomfort in your wrists and your shoulders come the end of it so then you might want to look at moving the bars closer and up a bit and that you've got to take into account there's a little bit more weight on the saddle. Yeah. So do you need a better padded bib short or do you need a saddle that maybe fits your shape a bit better, work out when there's hot spots developing. So those long rides are useful as well for optimising yeah. your equipment and position and knowing like come event day that you're not going to be four hours in and feeling like you're sitting on a bed of nails. Yeah, yeah, definitely a yeah. long ride expose any issues with your fit. And also equipment. fueling. And feel, yes, true, yeah. You need to get good at eating quite a lot for a <laughs> eight-hour plus event. Uh, yeah, we haven't talked about nutrition yet, but perhaps save that for a, a future episode. Yeah. How has age come into this? As you know, as an older cyclist, I know lots of people watching this are older. Does age have an impact on how much you train, how hard you train, or do you train the same amount, like junior versus someone in the 60s? How do you factor that in? It's an interesting one, because I'd say younger riders are generally able to recover better, um, and also the type of training they do is generally different, especially for juniors when they're in that growth stage. They want to improve things like lung capacity, muscle mass. They want that, and you can do that easier when you're younger. Um, they're probably not looking so much on the endurance level of things, yeah. but it's changing now where juniors have been picked up for World Tour teams. Like there's quite a big shift in how yeah. training is going because riders who are... 16 need to be able to train at a level a world tour team sees fit. I mean, yeah. I saw Kat Ferguson's uh, signed for Movistar. I think on her 18th birthday, she'll be straight off to them. But it used to be like the Grand Tour winners be like in their late 20s, kind of yeah. when they're in their prime, but now they're in their early 20s. Yeah, it it's always used to be shift. 27 was your peak. That's right, yeah. Now it's, if you're not winning world tour races by 19, you're past it. Yeah. But... Um, the pressure's on. <laughs> yeah. For them, anyway. <laughs> people develop at different rates. But yeah, when... Older athletes, it's taking into account all the different things. They've probably got more commitments in terms of family Definitely. and everything until the point where you're retired and you've got more time. Yeah. Um, you're at the age where maintaining muscle mass is important because you mentioned earlier with gym and not wanting to put on muscle. Yeah. But equally, there's been a few things that like cross-sectional area of thigh muscle is a good predictor of performance on the bike. You look at uh, Pogaccia, he's got quite big thighs for a Grand Tour rider compared to Vingegaard. That's why I'd say Pogac is better at one-day races and sort of more explosive yeah. events, but that's another thing to go into. <laughs> I think when you're training as an older athlete, you've got to take into account you probably need a bit more time to recover. A, because your body doesn't recover as quickly, and B, you've probably got more 
commitments, whether that's work or family, doing stuff in the garden, there's lots to consider there. The other thing is that the area that will probably suffer most isn't your endurance, it's going to be your higher capacity efforts. So with muscle mass decreasing and VO2 max decreasing, you want to really make sure you're getting those key efforts in still. So you're still wanting to train these really high intensity efforts, you just need to incorporate enough rest for them as well. Mm-hmm. But I think at that point, endurance isn't so much of a worry, especially if you've been riding for a long time, you have that good level of base fitness. And you see long endurance events at steadier states, like um, the transcontinental race. It's not younger riders doing those and being very good at those. It's people who are a bit older. So endurance is an element that you will be able to keep and be stronger at for longer. What you need to maintain is the muscle mass and the strength. So gym work, strength and conditioning, very, very important but also making sure you do those high capacity efforts on the bike. Don't neglect those. So short one minute maximal efforts and five minute VO2 repeats, they're going to be very useful for maintaining those fitness components that will suffer as you get older. I read a great book about ultra runners a few years ago and they were all in their fifties and sixties and older and they were just like absolutely bossing it because you don't lose that endurance as you get older. But I've noticed I definitely lose that top end. But I don't know whether I'm not training that top end enough or whether it's just I'm just losing it. Perhaps I need to focus more on that top end with intervals to incorporate that into my training and, and less bash around at tempo <laughs> pace. Perhaps. Yeah, I'd say sort of two sessions a week where it's that high intensity work is okay. going to be enough. Yeah. You don't fit in more than you can because then you're just going to be fatiguing yourself and you need to be able to rest from it to have that consistency. Um, And then it's the gym work as well. It pays massive dividends just in terms of maintaining muscle mass because if you maintain that muscle, that again is part of the predictor of performance with, I think it was a good cross section I saw and it was um, the difference between a 65 year old who had trained consistently with running and someone who hadn't. And it was like the inside of the leg was much there was much more muscle mass yeah. in there for the person who had ran because you've got that impact work which helps maintain muscle mass really well. So for cyclists, you want to be cycling and gym work for maintaining that. And then the strength, sorry, the uh, high intensity efforts are going to help maintain that element of performance because like you said, the ultra endurance runners, they're going at quite a low intensity, yeah. admittedly for sometimes 100 miles, which is ridiculous. <laughs> Crazy. But if you got them to do a 100 meter sprint... They'd be nowhere. Yeah, and they'd probably be nowhere compared to what they'd have been as an 18 year old. Yeah. Because that element of performance has changed. You also get a slight shift in muscle fiber type, so you'll probably will all have had a fast twitch and slow twitch. There's more detail in that, but the fast twitch can produce force very quickly, but they get really tired very quickly. Yeah. Whereas the slow twitch produce less force but can do it again and again and again. So a sprinter has that fast twitch to move very quickly with a lot of power, but can't do it for very long. Whereas the slow twitch can keep going and going and going. Um, so it's why Grand Tour sprinters, cycling sprinters, they tend not to have a very high age that they can keep being competitive at. Cavendish is the, the an oddity. Yeah. <laughs> and You've also got to take into account the lead out helps them a lot. But you yes. do see that sprinters in cycling often come up in waves and they're often younger. But Cavendish seems a lot that second kick he always had, and he like he'd kick and then kick again. He seemed to And another element could that a bit. be to be fair that as he's older, he's probably got better endurance, especially in a yeah. grand tour. Yeah, yeah. You need that endurance to perform at the end of it. I mean yeah. he's always the Champ king. Yeah. And he's still competitive at I mean, we saw the year he won the green jersey, he only just got picked by Wout Van Aert. Um, But yeah, I think think he's someone who's incorporated still that high capacity level of efforts. I know when he was doing more track work with the Rio Olympics, that sort of resurged his sprinting. I know with the track squad, GB, there's a lot of gym work involved. I can't say whether he was doing a lot of that as well, but it did bring out a 
another life in the sprinting performance. And so again, it's that high capacity efforts, maintaining muscle mass and maintaining those high level efforts. It is a case of when you get to an age where it starts reducing, it's use it or lose it. And if you're just riding low intensity, you lose the VO2 max capacity, you lose the glycolytic element. If you're not doing the gym work or the sprinting, you lose the muscle mass to produce those peak forces. So you need to train those elements. Don't neglect them. That train your weakness almost, and that which something we're all bad at, aren't we? Yeah, and even if you're not doing races, if you're doing climbs and you're yeah. riding with a group, you're going to go into that sort of VO2 max element up some of those climbs. So you still want to train that. And sprinting itself helps with maintaining some muscle mass elements because it's that high torque work. The strength work helps maintain that, as we said, for the strength and power work in the gym. It doesn't just help sprinting, it helps overall fatigue resistance and performance at higher capacities. So that's the big takeaway for older athletes is to not neglect the high intensity and ideally find room to incorporate strength training off the bike. Sounds good. That's some good, solid advice there, especially as an older cyclist here. So uh, thanks for your time, Andy. Fascinating chat. Uh, I'll put a link to Andy's website down below in case you want to find out more about his services as a coach and um, advice on your website as well. And if you've got any questions for a future episode, if you enjoyed this, um, let us know and we do some more um, topics that there are loads we talk about. Nutrition, do more on uh, riding into your 40s, 50s and 60s as well, can't we? So more Mm -hmm. we could uh, dive into. Uh, But yeah, thanks for watching. Thanks for your time, Andy. Thanks. See you again soon.